Hello, I'm Jack Titchener. Welcome to another edition of Illinois Lawmakers. Joining me here in the Speaker's Gallery of the Illinois House of Representatives, Rich Miller, the publisher and editor of the Capital Facts Newsletter. Been a busy week for you this week in particular, Rich. We've got kind of the clash of the titans going on here. We have dueling pension bills going over from the House and the Senate. Uh, quite an interesting uh, situation when you have the two most powerful Democrats in this building at odds with each other. Yeah, um, the, the speaker has a bill that saves a lot of money, uh, but has been widely criticized because it's likely un unconstitutional, Speaker Mike Madigan. In the Senate, you have Senate President John Carlton, who negotiated a bill with the labor unions. Doesn't save uh, as much as, or nearly as much as the Madigan bill does, but he claims it will be a lot more constitutional. Now, I just actually got out of a meeting with Cullerton. He called me in because of something I wrote about him this morning. And he wanted to explain that he doesn't, he wants to get beyond this template of speaker versus Senate president all the time, mm -hmm. clash of the titans, as, mm -hmm, as you would call it. That he's trying to work a deal here, that he's trying to get something done. He sent the speaker over, or he is today, sending the speaker over a bill a Senate bill that can be amended in the House rather than amending a House bill which couldn't be amended in the House. Um, and I think the end game is uh, he wants to go back to the old AB uh, formula where you put Madigan's bill on it and say if this is declared unconstitutional then Cullerton's bill becomes law. Um, I think that's the end game here plus probably a little tweaks here and there. Mm -hmm. Maybe something to do with uh, uh, cost shifting down to the schools, uh, pension costs down to the school board level. Uh, he didn't mention that. But I, I think rather than try to frame this as who wins, who loses, he wants to try to frame it as look, you know, Madigan can win, I can win, you know, we can all win here. Let's just cut something, cut a deal, and let's go. I do know that a lot of people in, in the House are eager to vote for Cullerton's bill because it's the easiest pension vote they will ever take. The unions, AFSCME, teachers, both teachers unions, right. uh, the AFL-CIO, uh, they're all supporting this bill. So you can support a pension reform bill, the next $45, $46 billion off the unfunded liability, or, or actually, I'm sorry, it saves right. $46 billion over 30 years. And the union support it, it's and much so you don't get beat up for it's it. It's a much easier when you go back home and meet with the folks at the local union hall, if Republican or Democrat. They're not screaming at you. Yeah. You've yeah. got to go back and live with these folks. That's, you know, people don't understand it. Yeah, they think this should be an easy vote. Maybe. But you've got to go home and live next door to the teacher, right? And you've got... You've and just shafted and you may have a, and you may have a new primary opponent you hadn't counted on yeah correct uh, what about the what about the cost shift though the speaker is organizing a meeting on that the, today and that's always been kind of a big deal for him in this whole process it's been a huge deal for him it saves a lot of money he, he's he's actually right on the on the merits of the of the idea uh, which is teachers are not state employees so why is the state picking up their pension the employer pension contribution Shouldn't the school districts be picking up the employer pension contribution? Local cities pick up the employer pension contribution. So he's right in, in that regard. But, but there's a real worry out there that shifting these billions of dollars in costs will lead to property tax increases. So it's just basically and moving money around and making people pay more one way or another. Yeah, and that's anathema for both sides of the aisle here. Yeah. No question about it. Rich Miller, thanks very much for your insights, as always, on this edition of Illinois Lawmaker. We really appreciate it. Up next, we have a newsmaker interview with the leader of the House Republicans, Representative Tom Cross of Oswego. House Republican leader Tom Cross of Oswego is our newsmaker interview on this week's edition of Illinois Lawmakers. Welcome back to the program, leader. Thanks for having me. Hey, good to have you here. Well, after years of inaction and a lot of false starts, there's a movement everywhere you, you look on, on pensions this week at the Capitol. Both Democratic leaders in the House and Senate have advanced their own versions of a pension reform plan. They both say they're constitutional. They think uh, they think it's the way to go. You were uh, you signed on to the bill that uh, moved out of the House the previous week, the bill that uh, Speaker Madigan was engineering. Can you tell us uh, what the highlights of that bill are? 
Well, it's a bill that we've, I've been working on with Elaine Neckerts and Daniel Biss for, for a number of years, and, uh, or, or a number of months. We've been yeah. working on this issue for a number of years, but um, we have about $100 billion unfunded liability on pensions. This bill that left the House would knock that down by about $30 billion. Over our payment cycle between now and 2045, the, at the moment, if nothing changes, it's going to cost us about 100. It's about 400 billion. That bill will knock that down by anywhere from 150 to 170 billion dollars. It increases contributions. Um, it changes the retirement age in, in minimal ways. Um, it changes when you will receive a cola, and it takes away the compounding cola that we have now. The cost of living increase that you get at three percent uh, to a lower rate and a, and a simple interest. And so it, it makes some changes on the benefit side. It provides some funding. Uh, we've got some b obligations on some borrowing that was done to make pension payments back when Governor Quinn started. Uh, when those bonds are paid off, we're going to use a portion of that money, almost a billion dollars, and put, infuse that into the pension payments to help us get to the, the, the number of 2045 of 100 percent fully funded on our pensions. Con considering where we are as the worst funded pension system, um, I think it's a pretty good bill. Um, Obviously, a lot of people have put some time into it, and to the Speaker's credit, he, uh, he stepped up to the plate finally. It's, uh, it's over in the Senate now where its fate is uncertain because the Senate is advancing its own uh, plan put forth by Senate President John Cullerton that was negotiated, crafted largely with, well, with a lot of union input, and uh, it takes a different approach. It's a series of things allowing uh, employees and retirees to make some choices between their uh, compounded colas and simple colas and uh, all the alphabet soup that goes into that and against the state uh, subsidized health insurance premiums. The key to it, according to the Senate president, is this offers uh, employees and retirees something that is constitutional because it offers them consideration. Well, I would, would make a couple of observations. Um, it, it, it knocks that, you, you work that $400 billion figure between now and 2045 of what it's going to cost the state. And on an annual basis, that's, you know, that's pretty significant if we do nothing. His bill drops that number by maybe 50 versus the bill that left the House of anywhere from 150 to 170. I think most observers would say his bill um, does not come even anywhere close to what the Madigan bill does or the House bill does in terms of reducing that unfunded liability. What, what the real fear is is that we'll be back here in the next couple years if that's the bill that passes just because of the sheer magnitude of the problem. I can't speak for him, but the Senate president has made public statements that said we could be back here if the House bill is the only thing that passes because that bill, to his interpretation, is clearly unconstitutional. The, the great thing about the pension debate has been there are, we have uh, numerous legislators have emerged as constitutional scholars. <laughs> the reality is nobody knows what's constitutional um, or not except the seven folks across the street in the Supreme Court building, whatever passes, um, with all due respect to the president, it's going to in all likelihood end up in court. Uh, we found out since the, the president unleashed his bill or, you know, let us hear about his bill that the retired teachers are opposed to his bill, President Cullerton. So in all likelihood, if his bill became law, they would file a lawsuit. So we will see a lawsuit on any pension bill. How, how big of an issue is that, since that was, if you will, to use the old term, an agreed bill over in the Senate, that this one group that represents about 35,000 retired teachers is, is saying, hey, we're going we're gonna to sue on this thing? Well, I think, look, whether it's the House bill, the Senate bill, there's going to be a lawsuit. And if you are a, if you're a retired teacher or current teacher, you in all likelihood are very angry that we're, uh, that we're doing anything to the pension systems. But as I say to them, we may very well not have a pension system if we don't address this. One of the arguments that you make in the House bill is that we have exhausted all of our uh, options on trying to get this under control. It has re it's wreaking havoc on the budget, squeezing out education, public safety, etc. And there's about nine pages in there that spells that out. But you're not out of options in the sense that you can still raise revenues to make some of these payments. Well, we just saw uh, the state, the Democrats, you remember the last lame duck session in the middle of the night, passed the highest increase, tax increase in the history of the state. At that day, at that time, we had about $7 billion in unpaid bills. We're now at $9 billion. So to, to, to have that issue of unpaid bills and then couple that with a huge pension problem, we're going to spend $8.5 billion out of a $35 billion budget on pensions. 
um, it's it's not the, the ability of raising money. I, I, revenue is, is almost impossible to address this issue. One of the one of the issues that uh, was the last minute stumbling block last year was not included in the bill that went over to the uh, Senate, and that has to do with the cost shift that Speaker Madigan has been pretty insistent upon yeah. for the last few years. Now he said that we're going to deal with that separately, and later today he's going to sit people down and start talking about. Uh, downstate schools, Collar County schools, starting to pay their share of the uh, teachers' retirement pension benefits. Let, let, let's back up just a second. Okay. That I think it's important. It, it fits into this cost shift discussion. I, I don't think people believe in Illinois that our pension system could could go under, go under, or, or or go into bankruptcy. We think that happens in other states and other countries. Ours is is the worst in the country, and it and, and it's it has to be dealt with in a significant way. The speaker's come along and to his credit has separated them and I appreciate that and said we want the, the locals to bear some responsibility of making some payments. There's some um, policy arguments to maybe have that discussion but what concerns me is, is several things. One, you're asking them to come in and try to fix or be part of a system that the state in many ways really uh, caused all the problems by not making pension payments. To, so to bring them into the mix and say oh help us fix this I think it's grossly unfair and it can have a significant impact on local property taxpayers in downstate Illinois and in suburban Illinois. Could that come come up again as let's say let's say for instance the Senate bill comes back over here and it starts to get amended could that be grafted into it and all of a sudden you've got this poison pill that kills pension reform? I, I think if anybody gets into the business and I'm not accusing anybody but if we start getting into poison pills and and creating, you know, diversions or, or picking on issues that are controversial and kills pension reform, that would be a real travesty for the, for the taxpayers and for the annuitants. We have got to fix pensions once and for all and get it, it and get it to the courts and let's find out what they have to say. We've got, we've got some other issues still hanging fire as we, as we move into these last few weeks of May. This is one, the biggest. One of those, of course, is concealed carry. Yeah. If, if you don't have a bill that uh, passes constitutional muster according to the appeals court by June 9th uh, here, then anybody could carry practically anything out there. Yeah, I, I think at the end of the day that uh, we'll find we, there's always the ability to find common ground in an issue if you want to, um, and I think this this ju June date hanging over our heads is probably helpful, and it, it, it creates kind of some awareness to members of the General Assembly. You better get you know you better do something. So it forces both sides to to try to be reasonable, and I think uh, I think people want to find that happy medium and. And I'm hopeful that we do it before we get out of here. We may very well be back in June. Can can uh, as the, some of the, some of the Senate negotiators have indicated, can you really carve out Chicago and Cook County from this and have something that passes? I, I don't know, and, and I, I have not looked at their language because you know we've been so embroiled in pensions and they, theirs hadn't gotten over here. But look, you've got you know Tim Bivens, who's a, a, a sh former sheriff mm -hmm. from out in the northwest part of the state. He's a bright guy, and um, I, my guess is Tim's a, a, a gun enthusiast, so he's he's respectful of that. You've got Senator Raul involved from the city of Chicago. So I think they're trying to find that happy ground. Uh, time will tell. We've got a few more weeks. You know, this place never never gets anything done ahead of time. It's usually a last minute. <laughs> this is probably a last minute issue. Uh, also on that last minute list probably is the issue of same-sex marriage. It's passed over in the Senate, but it's there, obviously it, there, it's still shy a handful of votes from coming to the floor over here in the House. Yeah, I, I'm not a, completely aware of the roll call. I've been told it's they're, they're a little bit short, but again, um, I've seen how this, we're, we're looking over the House chamber, I've seen how this place works. Um, I'm told the speaker's engaged somewhat in, in, in trying to pick up some votes on the Democrat side. So I don't know um, when, but, but my guess is that it, it will not go away. Your, your party just lost its state chairman, Pat Brady, in part over his early support of, of gay marriage. You've got a couple of your members publicly on board with this. Will there be any su significant support in the House GOP caucus? Look, we have a party that's uh, kind of struggling. We had a, a bad election. We've got to be a party that grows. We've got to be a party that's inclusive. Uh, we've got to be a party that, uh, um, you know, I think continues to, to focus on making this a better business climate for as a state, uh, shoring up the fiscal problems. And, and we need somebody that can, can be strong, can raise money, can be inclusive. So uh, the, some of the folks I've heard uh, fit that bill. And certainly I would love to see somebody from my caucus in that role. And we have some very capable people. We'll stay tuned.
Representative Tom Cross of Us We Go, the House Republican leader. Thank you for being with us here on Illinois Lawmakers. Always, always good to have you. Yeah. Still ahead on the program, we'll hear from two of the top pension negotiators in the Illinois House and Senate on where we go from here with one of the toughest issues that lawmakers, as Tom Cross has suggested, have ever faced in their careers. Democratic Senator Linda Holmes of Aurora shares sponsorship of the Senate's latest version of pension reform with Senate President John Cullerton. She joins uh, Representative Darling Singer of Naperville, the Republican spokeswoman on the House Personnel and Pensions Committee. Good to have you both here. Uh, good to be here. Good to see neighbors back together, yeah. you know. Yep. <laughs> Senator Holmes, the Senate has taken a different tack in arriving at the language that's, it, that's in your bill. There were lengthy negotiations with the unions leading up to this, and it's all based on a sense of consideration for the retirees and current state employees uh, to give them some choices. L let's hear some of the details. What's in the bill? Some of the details of that, there is sort of a section that's devised in many ways for younger members in, in tier one that are going to be affected by this. And their choice allows them to have a 3% COLA, but it's a 3% simple COLA. Future salary increases will be pensionable. They'll still have access to retiree health care. And there will be a two-year delay in receiving their COLA. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, then the next choice is almost what we call choice B, but then it's broken into two parts. One part being the 3% compounding COLA, no future salary increases are pensionable, and no access to retiree health care. The final option is to have your 3% compounding COLA, although it would be delayed for three years. You would pay 2% of your salary would be going into the pensions. In addition, you still would have access to retiree health care once you retire. So those are pretty much the, the, the broad sweeps mm -hmm. and components. And this was something negotiated with uh, the help of many of the state workers unions uh, who are concerned about how this is going to work out in the end. Yes, several, several meetings um, Senate President John Cullerton and I had with the unions getting their input. And as always, these were not easy negotiations. We as a state were looking to be able to solve the problem, understanding that the unions were not the cause of the problems. It was our underfunding of pensions in the past decades that caused the problem. Yet, in order to resolve the problem, we needed to have some budget relief. So there did have to be this shared sacrifice component to it. And I'm grateful that the union sat down and negotiated with us. Representative Singer of the House took a different approach. It's a bit more draconian than the, uh, the plan that is emerging in the Senate, but it was one that uh, most Democrats, quite a few Republicans, felt like they could get behind. Could you go over the broad brushstrokes of the, you know, the House the, plan? Yeah, the broad brushstrokes of the House plan, basically um, what the House plan is doing is it's really focusing on what we need to change in a benefit formula to get us to the point where we can make a contribution to shore this unfunded liability up once and for all. So the strategy was let's get to the point where we know the state can make those payments, and that's for the unfunded, you know, liability on a basis where it, it can be done, which we haven't been able to do in the past. And then we can make sure that when one retires until their death, they'll get a pension check. So it's focusing more on um, color reductions for both retirees and those who are, you know, in tier one, um, caps on salaries, which helps to do a couple things, uh, get rid of abuses and, and you know, some, some other stuff there, a uh, phased in, um, Retirement age, working longer, depending on how old you are. If you're mm -hmm. over 45, you will not work any longer. If you're coming in the system, you know you're going to be working years longer, and it's all contingent on what the retirement age is for that system, and a, more money into the system, and an increased um, employee contribution. So the focus is that, you know, we're really looking at the two things here, the, you know, making sure that when this goes to court, you know, it's, it's 
first part of it is can you make that payment? And it has a guarantee, but boy, if you're guaranteeing something, we better make sure we can make that payment. Then you raise an interesting point, uh, and that comes down to the constitutionality of this. There are two different approaches at work here. In the Senate, it's the consideration for the employee to be, or retiree, to be able to choose between one form of COLAs and the possibility of subsidized health insurance premiums. With the House, with that really long preamble in the bill that talks about the financial difficulties of the state, it seems to be more pointed toward taking advantage of the state's use of emergency powers to deal with what could be a hundred billion dollar problem. Yeah, and, and that is that is the approach, the consideration piece from the House perspective is that we've done everything we could possibly do to you know, get us out of this problem and we just can't. For the Senate, it, it hinges upon uh, a legal opinion by the senators, uh, the Senate President's uh, le chief legal counsel right. that consideration has to be a part of this. The consideration, giving giving an option, and the option when you talk about the access to retiree health care, that is not constitutionally protected, whereas the the benefits are. It, it clearly states in the Constitution that those cannot be diminished. I want to bring up one more point because in our plan. It ended up where the unions, we were not going to affect the retirees at all. The unions ended up bringing the retirees into this. So they also have an option where if they want to keep access to their retiree health care and their 3% compounding COLA, mm -hmm. there is a two-year freeze on the COLA. It will happen over three years, not two subsequent years. Or one other option is keep that 3%, but you will not have access to retiree health care. And all said, we come out with about $46 billion of savings over 30 years. In addition, we do have the funding guarantee and a pension stabilization factor built within this bill that we're extremely important that we keep that in there. Representative Singer, the House plan didn't really bring up the health insurance, did it? No, it's it's not because again, it's not. We didn't work the policy of you. You know, healthcare is is not written under the Constitution. We're working the the policy perspective that you know we're going to make sure we can we can make that benefit. So at, at this point, with the House bill, it kind of goes back to the master contract that was reached with AFSCME uh, earlier this year as to how they'll deal with health insurance premiums for the retirees. We yeah, that's the bill we passed, uh, 1313. 13, mm -hmm. Yeah. That's it. We're dealing with health care in, in that yeah, regard. Yeah. Now, now, Senator, you, you raised uh, the point of how much the Senate bill would, would save over the years. Uh, that's about uh, $46 billion over 30 years. The House bill saves quite a bit more than that, uh, according to the uh, speculation or the estimates, not speculation. Estimates are about $140 billion. Yeah. And, and the difference, you know, the... the this, and this is something we, we discussed when we were in the governor's work group last spring also, is that with the consideration piece, we really don't know what the bill will save until choices are made. So we don't know how many people will take what, and I don't think the numbers can be worked out. I mean, we can do one extreme or the other extreme, but we don't know what the choices will be in the middle until someone votes. Senator? Right, and we've gone with the $46 billion number is assuming 50%, 50%, although the unions, as they talk to this, really feel that more, because they have more younger members, that it actually is going to be more selecting that plan, which results in greater savings. So we're really looking at savings between 46 and 51 billion. Well, we're sticking with using the 46 billion number, thinking it makes more sense to be a little more conservative on it. Anything we save in addition to that is, is yeah. good. And I think that the big perspective we have to keep in mind is that even though we're talking numbers of one, you know, 149, 46, the, the 30 year overall 30 years. is close to 400 billion. So I mean, it's it's a huge, huge problem. That you know, you're, it's how much can you dent that unfunded liability? Even and our concern is that if the the House bill is what ultimately passes and it's found unconstitutional. It doesn't save $140 billion. It saves nothing, and we're back in the beginning negotiation process here. Whereas the point of bringing the unions in and having a negotiated and agreed-to bill 
it, it handles that innate fairness issue. The the Senate bill had a lot of union backing, but one group has come, one significant group has come out. The Illinois Retired Teachers Association says you're still forcing us to make a, a decision that is very uncomfortable, it's onerous, it's coercive, and they're going to fight this bill in court just like everyone else is lining up to fight the House bill in court. Right, and now it's, it's interesting because I have a letter right here from an Illinois Retired Teachers Association, the, the, and she's president of the suburban, a uh, suburban local IFT, saying, no, I understand you're getting some calls on that, but on the whole, our members really do feel like the retirees need to be part of the shared sacrifice. So it's it's a portion of them, so you do have some that are We've got, we've got about less than a minute here left. You have these two dramatically different pieces of legislation in both houses here. How can you meet in the middle or, or work something out so that you're done with this by the end of May? I think I think we we have to. I, I think it would really be an embarrassment after all the work that's been put into yeah. this for any of us to go home without coming up with something that we feel really adequately addresses and solves our pension problem. We can't kick this down the road and continue. And, and no, I agree. I mean, it is costing us, you know, 17 million a day in interest costs to, to delay the thing. But it's going to be, I mean, it's, everyone knows it's going to be between Cullerton and Madigan. I wish you both luck. Thanks Good. very much. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Holmes, Representative Sanger. That is it for this week's edition of Illinois Lawmakers. We'll be back with the latest on the uh, spring session of the Illinois General Assembly next, week's here, next week here on the program. Watch Illinois Lawmakers online at IllinoisLawmakers.org or on Comcast on demand where available from all of us at Illinois lawmakers so long from Springfield